Today, many people are wondering whether we are at the brink of another world war. And not without reason. In particular, the current war in Israel is threatening to escalate. What does the Bible have to say about this? It reveals to us the war that the world is indeed approaching. Armageddon, the war of all nations against God. Tensions continue to rise all over the world. In Russia and the Ukraine, China and Taiwan, and most importantly, Israel. NATO is planning a large-scale maneuver with 90,000 troops. The EU is planning military operations in the Red Sea. The German Bundeswehr is preparing for war. And so is Poland. The Bible shows us that this present age will end with a war. However, this will not be a nuclear war between nations, but rather a war in which the armies of the whole world will fight against God himself. That is why so many nations today are rising up against Israel, God's earthly people. We should then recognize that the current conflicts in the world are paving the way for the war of Armageddon. So when will this war take place? At the end of the final seven years of this age, described by the prophet Daniel in chapter 9, verse 27. In the middle of the seven years, the beast, the Antichrist, will put an end to animal sacrifices of the Jews in Jerusalem. Then he will rule over the earth for three and a half years. Toward the end of his reign, he will gather the armies of all the nations to war against God at Armageddon. Revelation 16 tells us, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons, performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And they gathered them together to the place called, in Hebrew, Armageddon. Armageddon is located at the plain of Megiddo in northern Israel. The armies of the whole world will gather there for war. But which nations will start the war against God and his people? This is what the prophet Ezekiel shows us. In the last video, we showed that Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 are about the war at Armageddon and not about Gog and Magog at the end of the Millennial Kingdom. It says, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am coming against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal. Persia, Ethiopia and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togarma from the far north, and all its troops, many people are with you. Gog is the prince of Meshech and Tubal of the land of Magog. According to the historian Flavius Josephus, the land of Magog belonged to the Scythians, a nomadic people dating back to the 8th century BC. They lived mainly north of the Black Sea in what is now known as southern Russia and Ukraine. Meshech and Tubal correspond to the Moshi and the Tiberini. These two tribes were located between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, that is, in the Caucasus. The Persians, whose armies will join Gog and Magog, lived in the region that is now part of Iran. Kush and Put correspond to Ethiopia and Libya, that is, the territory of North Africa. Togarma is located in the territory of present-day Armenia. Gomer are the Sumerians, an ancient equestrian people who moved across the Caucasus to Anatolia. This corresponds to the area of today's Turkey, even as far as Central Europe. If we look at these regions today, what do we see? The very nations mentioned by Ezekiel 
are all uniting against Israel right now. This is already a clear sign of what will happen at the end of this age, that all the nations of the earth will gather together against God at Armageddon. The nations Ezekiel mentioned are those who initiate the war as they are geographically close to Israel. Then the rest of the armies of the whole world will join forces with them. This is what God himself says through the prophet Zechariah. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces. Though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. In the end, the armies of the whole world will lay siege to Jerusalem, poised to conquer it, as Zechariah 14 and verse 2 tells us. But it is precisely at this moment that the God of Israel will intervene. Jesus Christ himself will come down to Jerusalem and save his people. Zechariah also reveals to us how God's people will be saved by Jesus. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two, from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain will move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And you shall flee through my mountain valley. Everything will take place exactly as it is described here in God's word. Although the armies today are against Jerusalem, in that day the beast and his armies will gather to ultimately fight against God himself. Revelation 19 says, And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gather together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. The one who sat on the horse to counter the armies is Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the lion lamb who will utterly destroy the armies of the nations. Revelation 17 says, These will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And how will Jesus Christ destroy the armies of the nations? Zechariah says, It shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. They will fight each other and slay themselves, just as they did in Gideon's day. This is exactly how Jesus Christ will tread the winepress of God's wrath. Though all the armies of the nations will think they are going to Jerusalem to wage war against the Lamb. In reality... God will gather them directly into his winepress. Revelation 14, 19 to 20 is about God's winepress. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw the harvest into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs. The prophet Isaiah confirms this and writes concerning Christ, Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Bosra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger, and trampled them in my fury. The blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart. Jesus Christ will begin his triumphal march against the besiegers in Bosra, which is located in the south of present-day Jordan, near the ancient city of Petra. 
From there, he will tread the winepress of God's wrath into the valley of Jehoshaphat, the Kidron Valley between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives. The prophet Joel says, Let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes arrive in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The blood of the mighty army of the nations will reach to the horse's bridles, 1,600 furlongs, about 290 kilometers long, stretching from Bosra to Armageddon. It is precisely on this route that the valley of Jehoshaphat in East Jerusalem is located. Jesus Christ is victor, and what a victory it is. The beast and the false prophet will be thrown directly into the lake of fire. By the sharp sword out of his mouth, Jesus Christ will strike and destroy their armies. Then the king of kings will bring the millennial kingdom of righteousness and peace to earth. Now that we see how close the end of this age is, we have to ask ourselves, what does this mean for us? Revelation 19 also shows us that Jesus Christ will not come alone to fight the armies. It is written, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. The armies in heaven are not angels, but believers. Their uniform is white linen, the same material of the wedding garment of Christ's prepared bride in Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. But not all believers will be part of this army. Only the overcomers, the male child in Revelation 12, and the firstfruits in Revelation 14, who follow Jesus the King. Thus, the all-important question is, will you be part of the armies of heaven? It's not enough just to be a believer. You must be an overcoming believer. In Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus speaks directly to the seven churches, not to the unbelievers. And what does he say to them seven times? He who overcomes and he who has an ear. That is, most Christians do not have an ear to hear. They don't want to overcome. Yet there are so many things that we Christians still must overcome. If we want to be part of the armies of heaven, it is not enough just to be a believer. We must overcome and be a first fruit. First fruits are those believers who are the first to be spiritually mature during their lifetime. Only these will be taken as first fruits, raptured, and belong to the armies of heaven. For more details, please check out this presentation. The armies of heaven are called, chosen, and faithful. Yes, many are called, but few are chosen, and even fewer are faithful to the end. Since we see the end approaching, we should wake up. Don't just be a believer. Be a believer who overcomes and prepares to be a first fruit. Use the remaining short time to prepare for the end. <laughs>